Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic, and we're delighted to have you back for our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. We have a very interesting guest today and a longtime friend, Dr. Robert Cloninger. And Robert is um, at Wash U in St. Louis and somebody who's done really important work, actually, in a lot of areas. I guess one fundamental area of work could be in genetics, but genetics that underlie many conditions. Schizophrenia is one where you've studied um, some really interesting and come up with some really interesting findings recently. And also personality, which is an area that I'm interested in, as you know, and we've talked a lot about. Um, just a title or two, um, uh, Robert is Wallace Renard Professor of Psychiatry, Genetics, and Psychology, many areas at Wash U. Um, and I liked one thing in his uh, website, so I'll just read it to you. My research on personality and well-being is directed toward person-centered diagnosis and treatment to improve health and quality of life, as well as reducing the burden of disease. And that's really what we do here at the Menninger Clinic as well as we can in terms of trying to help people. Um, Bob is here to provide us with a real treat. Tomorrow, um, he is going to deliver the McGovern Lecture, which is one of our named lecture series um, for Grand Rounds in the department. And I'll tell you his title, and I hope some of you at least will be able to see this and listen to him tomorrow. Um, he's going to talk on the science of well-being, the role of transcendence in health and happiness. A modest topic. <laughs> <laughs> So no talk. one ever accused me of being modest. <laughs> talk to us a little about that, Bob. Well, as you indicated with the first sentence about my interest in person-centered diagnosis and treatment, uh, I feel we have to understand who the person is that we're treating and not to think about them as someone who carries a disease, but someone who has the potential for health and happiness. And by focusing on what their strengths are and what their opportunities are, we can direct people toward making something of their life that will be satisfying to them and enable them to achieve their goals and follow the values that they, things that they put a value to. And unfortunately, I think too much of psychiatry today is just thinking about how can I quickly and efficiently reduce symptoms without thinking about how you actually help people develop their life as a creative process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been interested in this, um, what's the right word, uh, uh, transitional connectivity or, or I guess um, dimensional approach that really uh, is a spectrum between normal different types of behavior or what we would call normal and what in the field is labeled as a disorder or an illness. How, what got you started in <laughs> uh, being interested in that, that kind of spectrum? Well, that's a, a big question because at Washington University, the emphasis by my mentors was very much on biological reductionism and trying to reduce things to the molecules that cause diseases. But I always thought that things were more complex than that. And so um, after about 15 years of work in strict biological psychiatry, um, I d ventured into trying to learn how to assess personality. Mm -hmm. And I started out by measuring temperament traits, mm -hmm. you know, related to fear, anxiety, dis disgust, anger, very s s primitive emotions. Mm -hmm and developed reliable ways to measure that that turned out to be very good at subtyping personality disorder. Well, and that's part of what you later then even called the temperament personality, the temperament character inventory, TCI, right. is that right? I started out with the temperament part okay. of it. Okay. But then I realized that many people would have very similar temperament profiles, but some would be very healthy, successful executives and others might be totally unproductive and miserable and suicidal. And I knew that I had left out something very important. The, the joke was that my temperament model was called, I think, by Peter Kramer as the humanist nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> by the time he used that term, I was at wor actively working to develop the, the humanist dream to figure out how we could describe the characteristics that in DSM-5 got called the healthy personality. Mm -hmm. And this was being self-directed, being cooperative, mm -hmm. and then I added self-transcendence to mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because I knew that people spent more time in prayer and meditation than they did in many other more materialistic activities. And that, that part of our world and our lives doesn't get as much focus for the most part. Here we have an institute on spirituality and religion and Jim Lomax in our department is very involved as you know. We have an annual symposium that's actually quite wonderful. But, but um, say a little bit more what you mean when you say self-transcendence. Well, self-directedness just involves our ability to use ego strengths to control, direct, make decisions about what's happening in our environment and what we want to achieve. Cooperativeness allows us to get along with one another. Mm -hmm. And self-transcendence then involves giving values to things that go beyond our own selfish needs and goals. So that can include making sacrifices for other people, your community, or being concerned about the sustainability of what we're doing to the earth, as well as extending to uh, trying to develop a sense of connectedness with what's divine and sacred. That's interesting. And there are many versions of that in terms of what people believe. Correct. Oh, and, and it's not so much the conclusions you draw, but your openness to looking beyond uh -huh. yourself mm -hmm. and having this be an authentic process of understanding, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What's valuable? So that's, that's really nice. And, and it's, I'm putting it in my words, but sort of being interested in making the world better and, and helping in a social broader sense. I always think of the biopsychosocial model and this is kind of the social end um, to some degree yeah. and even beyond. If, if you're not that interested in being altruistic or in what might be in your, your, your concept of self-transcendence, so is that a missing part? Is that something you should have and uh, is it a problem? Well, we have to be careful even about the way you ask the question because if you turn it into a should, then people are gonna be driven um, for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. to try to be something they're not. And no healthy character is really forced. It, I see a, a healthy pro personality development as a process of self-understanding and discovery that always has to build on what you find meaningful and useful and whatever promotes your own satisfaction. And, and so, yes, my conclusion is that if we let ourselves be restricted to only work in love mm -hmm. in the narrow sense of people who are in my family who I see as extensions of myself, right. then there's a limit to just how healthy and happy you are. We find that organized characters who are self-directed and cooperative are actually healthy physically. They can have a lot of social satisfaction, emotional satisfaction. But unfortunately now, there are some challenges in the world <laughs> that require huge, right? us, I think, make it essential for us to be concerned about the sustainability mm -hmm. of the way we're living our lives, mm -hmm. to be concerned about what's happening in another country, like France mm -hmm. or Syria, right now, uh, right. that ultimately is a threat to all of us because we, we, as we reflect on who we are, then that can expand to include a sense that all of humanity is our family and that the earth is not an inexhaustible resource and that if we're destroying our own backyard yeah. and we're robbing our grandchildren yeah. of a yeah. future, yeah. then we're being selfish yeah. and short-sighted. Yeah. And so this is really what I mean by self-transcendence. It does lead to an interest in spirituality. Mm -hmm. It does lead to a cultivation of virtues. Mm -hmm. But these are not religious dogmas as much as they are the things that make everybody's life yeah. meaningful yeah. and satisfying, yeah. like honor, yeah. integrity, yeah. wisdom. I, I just think that's so interesting and it's just great. So um, it, it's, it's 
a way that we need to be reminded to think and view others and wonder about what we're doing and whether there might be ways we could be more satisfied that we haven't thought of in this direction. I go back to what I said a minute ago that, and we all use the biopsychosocial, so I'm gonna now flip it around because you're one of the people, I com comes to my mind right away as sort of the um, definitive biopsychosocial um, researcher, clinician, uh, psychiatrist, uh, professional. I've tried to do that because I felt unless you pay attention to the fact that a human being really does have three aspects, yeah. body, thought, and soul. Right. And if we neglect any one of them, we're not going to be balanced, we're not going to be healthy, right. we're not going to be fulfilled. So that's a segue into my next question, which is talk a little bit about the bio side, because you're very interested in that, and I mean mostly the, actually maybe on the just a word or two about the recent work you're doing uh, on genetics uh, with regard to personality okay. types. You said something earlier that I'll catch up on, and that was that interest in body, thought, and soul can be related to the biopsychosocial model. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered about the adequacy of the definition of um, social being the third aspect. Mm -hmm. And I was critical of the World Health Organization for not including spirituality. Mm -hmm. But as I've worked with the World Health Organization, I saw that they had a real practical dilemma that they didn't want to alienate groups of people who didn't, they didn't want to get into religious arguments. Yeah. And their view of social is very universal. Mm -hmm. So they're concerned about equity mm -hmm. and social justice. Mm -hmm. And the moment you bring a universal dimension to social, it really is spirituality. Yeah, yeah, that and makes so I'm sense. very comfortable yeah, with that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you clarified that, and actually, that's sort of how I was thinking about it in the connection of what you were describing. And, and the same then applies when I go to look at the biology of well-being, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if we only look to reduce our behavior to things that we can predict from genes that we're born with, then we make a couple of mistakes, and that is that we're discovering that the way the genome works is not as a bunch of individual players that just do their thing, but as like an orchestra mm -hmm. where the different members come together mm -hmm. and they work in concert. Mm -hmm. And so we have to learn to get that orchestra to play with harmony right. And, right. and to convey meaning and yeah. to express things that are satisfying yeah. to us. And that's the way we've taken genetics which had been stuck looking at just the average effects of individual genes to try to look at it in a person-centered way to see how these different genes work together and how the choices we make about the way we live our lives and the things that we aspire to, how that changes the biology because we then start expressing different mm -hmm. genes. And so when you bring someone to Meningers and you're able to keep them in a stable, attractive environment that shows respect for their dignity as a human being for an extended period of time, then you give them a setting in which they can start to flourish mm -hmm. by becoming more aware and setting goals and then starting to have the, the confidence and the encouragement to realize that they're in charge of orchestrating the rest of their life. Yeah. And uh, I think it's necessary to do that kind of thing. That's so interesting and I love your metaphor because uh, it, it really says a lot that, that is applicable. So there are many types of music, there are many types of musicians, they don't all play at the same time and they don't all even participate in one piece whereas they might in another. So we activate our, to use the analogy, our instruments that are our genes um, and there may be different combinations and we can turn them on or off. Exactly. So I think that's really a nice metaphor. And so by doing the kind of research, the biological research you're doing, where you can look at what's happening inside the brain, you get a picture of what are the processes in the, the brain that are enabling our goals and our values to develop. And, and so it's a wonderful time in psychiatry to actually have the tools that allow us to take an understanding of the brain systems mm -hmm. 
and our mental structures and our values mm -hmm. and see how these interact with each other to create, under some conditions, ill health and under other conditions, well-being. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's just wonderful. And I, I'm going to stop us there because we always run out of time. <laughs> uh, but I really, it's, it's a tantalizing taste of, of what I'd love for everybody to hear more about from you. So for those of you who can, I hope you'll join us tomorrow at our Grand Rounds at the Alfred Educational Center at um, the, the um, Mayor Campus at Baylor. Um, and it's, I think, at 10.30 tomorrow morning. Um, and thank you so much, Bob, for joining us. It's great to have a minute to chat with you. Um, and I look forward to the talk tomorrow. My pleasure to be here and see a wonderful campus. Yeah. Well, thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again next time.